human behavior is the most amazingly flexible behavior of any animal species. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV, and today we're talking with John Tooby and Lita Cosmides of UC Santa Barbara. Thanks for talking to us. You guys are uh, central to evolutionary discussions of things like anthropology, psychology, applications of evolutionary theory to all aspects of human existence. What's the primary insight that an evolutionary approach, approach brings to, uh, to the table? We're, we're particularly associated with evolutionary psychology, sure. but that connects to all of the social sciences and humanities. Um, because theories about the design of the human mind are central to all of those areas. And so we're, we're asking the question, um, what kinds of adaptive problems were our hunter-gatherer ancestors? What kinds of problems did they have to solve well in order to survive and reproduce in those environments? And what kinds of cognitive mechanisms would be well designed for solving them because that, that gives you insights into what to look for in the human mind. The key thing that changes it from other kind of approaches to psychology is instead of looking at the mind as a blank slate, we see the mind as full of very interesting, reliably developing programs, species typical programs that um, guide our behavior. Uh, you know, when you talk about little programs, you're starting to use computer metaphors, which I'm assuming when evolutionary psychology or a precursor sociobiology or whatever, uh, ethology, you weren't using that. So how, how that was, much? That was the problem. They were talking about selection pressures and they were talking about behavior, but behavior is generated by programs in your head. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean it metaphorically. Yeah. Devices that are designed by natural selection to process information, guide your behavior. And you, evolutionary psychology focuses on that intermediate step of what's the structure of those programs. And without understanding that, you just all you can have is sort of fuzzy relationships between insights about selection pressures and behavior as opposed to a real science of the mind. One of the primary differences is the traditional worldview was the mind was something like a tape recorder or a blank slate general learning system. And the model of human nature was we're just a passive receptacle and culture and our environment is downloaded into us without the mechanisms of the mind inscribing a particular content of their own. So, I mean, this just is just like a video camera doesn't inscribe, it, it just reports what's right. out. In the so, world. I mean, this is kind of following up on a, a critique of pure reason that there are pre existing structures or, or strictures on how we process information, what information we see, and then how we respond to it. That, that's exactly right. But, so, but can I just say, yeah. I, wouldn't call them, I wouldn't call them strictures, right. because that presumes that a, a, that a blank slate mind right. could learn anything. Yeah. And it's actually not computationally possible for a, a completely, a mind that was right. com completely domain general that operated uniformly in all context to learn anything that's useful. And so I think of these programs as enabling learning. Mm -hmm. They enable culture. So in uh, sociobiology, the, the book by E.O. Wilson is one of the watershed beginnings of this kind of broad area of, uh, of analysis. Since then and now, uh, while evolutionary psychology and ev evolutionary approaches to all sorts of things are still contested, but they're much more accepted, much more widespread. What, what explains that? So uh, Ed's book, gave the best evolutionary biology of its time, and although this is not generally known to social scientists, it went on to just totally conquer the biology journals. It's not called something separate, it's just evolutionary biology right. now, but that's not a complete thing. So really what evolutionary psychology is, is it's the intersection of evolutionary biology with information theory, computer science, and then with, and it, so, so that's the programs are what evolved and then you have to know the environment in which they evolved and functioned and so that's then the third component of uh you know hunter-gatherer studies and primatology and reconstruction of the past and is it partly that uh, i mean it's more accepted now in in a way that the idea of the blank slate of whether it was in anthropology or psychology has kind of faded because it doesn't explain enough there's many things that have made it made that fade more it still exists but it, it's faded um, the, some has been because of research and, and, and theory in evolutionary psychology, some because of cognitive neuroscience. In cognitive neuroscience, it's becoming clearer and clearer that many mechanisms are domain specialized for particular kinds of problems. Um, uh, there's also been, uh, we had to do a lot of debugging of, of misconceptions. 
people had a lot of mis they thought that if you're taking an evolutionary approach, that means y you must be racist, sexist, etc. When it doesn't even have a, it has to do with human universals, not to do with things like race. What what does evolutionary psychology then have to say if it's saying okay, well we're talking about universal behavior, but then you're also studying variation among subpopulations? What you know where where does it end, especially for libertarians, because we want to believe in a kind of domain of unrestricted freedom, but we also want to be rooted in an empirical world that is uh, available through rational analysis. I mean, because you're not saying everything go, everything can go, but you're also not saying that everything is predetermined. It's not universal behaviors. It's, it's actually the genetic developmental basis of the programs that's universal. Um, so, and that, that's one of the key things, because uh, uh, the whole point of having a brain is to make your behavior dependent on information from your environment. So you expect there to be varying behavior depending on the environments that you're encountering. And you can't know in advance what's inevitable and what's not inevitable socially um, until you know something about the design of these mechanisms. Just like being nearsighted doesn't mean you can't see. Uh, you, there's glasses, contact lenses, there's laser surgery. Why is that true? Because people bother to figure out how the eye works. Mm -hmm. If you understand how a mechanism works, you know how to intervene in some way. I mean, it's very important what Lita just said, that human behavior is the most amazingly flexible behavior of any animal species, right? And we don't know of some intrinsic limits about what could be potentially expressed by people in, a different, in various environments or different ways of interacting. Uh, but you can't unlock these potentialities unless you understand the the circuit logic or the code of the programs in the head. So for example, people tend to, aut to automatically categorize people on the basis of race. And then they found it was very, they couldn't get people to stop doing it. And it, it turns out that uh, from an evolutionary perspective, it would be very unlikely you'd have a mechanism, a program whose function was to detect race because you never would have run into ancestrally somebody from a different race. So it had to be that the program's function was different, okay? And uh, we hypothesized that the program's function uh, was to detect coalitions. And therefore, in the modern world, certain kinds of input of alliance and so on then made race, as opposed to any of the thousands of other dimensions of human variation, uh, a, a kind of cue to who would likely ally with who. And so we created experiments in which race no longer predicted coalition, in just a few minutes, as so you have a lifetime of experience, supposedly of learning race, right? Uh, but people stopped categorizing by race in their memory systems in their sort of implicit uh, ways. And that was, uh, if you find the right aspect, what, what's the, what is the feature of the program, then you can start to have, make much more deliberate active progress towards whatever your social goals have to how, be. How do you know when differences are big and really matter, say, and, and when they're trivial? So like, you know, is hair color, we would say is trivial. I mean, it has meaning, but compared to gender, or and not even gender, but you know, physical differences among the sexes or between the sexes. How do you, how do you figure that out? And also then in any population, I'm assuming that the differences among women or with, within, say, the category of women, are as great as they are between women and men, or you know, how, how do you find out what is salient then? Well, we don't try to quantify that. What we try to do is, and our colleagues try to do is, understand the causal mechanisms that result in whatever, whatever variation you see around you. There's gender differences and gender similarities. I mean, some mechanisms, if the men, men and women ancestrally had a similar adaptive problem to solve, you, you don't expect there to be differences in the mechanisms that solve them. It's when there were adaptive problems like ones in hunting versus foraging that, that differed by the sexes, that's when you expect to see some differences. Um, but you need to know the structure of the mechanism involved. So colleagues of ours, um, there had been a hundred years of theory-free research looking at spatial cognition in humans, and people kept finding a male advantage on certain kinds of spatial cognition. Some of our colleagues thought, well, what, what would you need, what kind of spatial cognition would you need to be a good gatherer? And they said, well, you, you need to remember where things are in a complex array. You need to be able to, um, plants don't, don't get up and move around, but they might not be fruiting now, they might be fruiting later, so you want to remember that, you want to be able to go straight to one of those patches and so on. And uh, through a series of experiments, from right from the beginning, they found the first female advantage that any psychologist had found in spatial cognition. Um, 
And it's because, it's not because the scientists were male or female or anything like that. It's because they were starting from a theory about the adaptive problems our ancestors faced. Now, once you know something about the mechanisms that are governing spatial cognition, you, can, you, you could, in principle, design math programs that might make certain kinds of mathematical concepts easier to understand depending on how you, in particular, think about it. And that doesn't have to be taught to people on the basis of their gender, because there's, as you said, there's a lot of variation within genders, too. But if you understand it, that's when you can start to use it for good. One difference between the blank slate approach is that you're the basic model of human dignity is your clay. You are passively acted on by the outside world. Whereas an evolutionary psychology model, the person is in a really strong sense inventing themselves. And uh, that, that we, instead of just downloading the environment and becoming what you're told to be. And also it just in these individual, in, in prosperous societies with lots of choices, you get this amazing fluorescence in which people get together in groups and they very creatively construct a lot of rich, diverse ways in which uh, individuals, you know, uh, find themselves and build their identities. And that's, that's a very different worldview than the we are passive and empty receptacles at first and then or that everything is fixed ahead of time or that everything yeah. is or that fixed everything that's, is the, fixed. that's yeah. the thing that people fear right yeah. but that's not what what's f fixed is the design of the programs but the programs are themselves designed to be very flexible well we'll leave it there i want to thank john tooby and lita cosmides from ucsb talking about evolutionary psychology today thanks guys sure thank you for reason tv i'm nick gillespie